You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. I'm Will, and today I'm joined by Frank Thompson to talk about the impacts and importance of understanding marine underwater noise and its impact on the ocean and marine life. Thanks for joining me today, Frank. Hello, Will. Good to be here. Great. So before we get into the main subject of the podcast, what we do on, on our episodes is we just do a little icebreaker question, which is our random ocean question. So your question is, what is your favorite marine animal and why? Well, that's easy to answer in a way for me because, uh, you know, this has got to be orcas or killer whales. And, um, you know, and they are, I think they are really beautiful uh, animals. Um, I was attracted towards them when I was a kid, you know, watching them and on television. Um, and um, I always wanted to study them. So I was always fascinated by them. And, and I think they are beautiful. They are highly intelligent animals. And they're super interesting when you study their social lives because, you know, because they have a very interesting group structure and really beautiful sounds as well. So number one is always killer whales for me. Or, or as we used to say, that's a better name for them, I guess. Yeah. A bit, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a better name. Um, no, great answer. So... Before we get into to underwater noise, do you want to just talk a little bit about your career background, how you got to where you are today, you know, what, what sure. you do and, and, and a bit about sort of whether you always wanted to, to work in sort of the marine science sector or whether it was something that you came on to later in life or, or just a bit of background. Yes, I yeah, that's, um, well, it's a long story, but I try to make it short. Uh, I, I did study at Hamburg University, I, so I did study killer whales. I ended up doing um, my right. PhD and master's thesis on... on um, orca acoustics on their sounds and, and how they use them and actually what the purpose of the sound is. So I studied a, a very a tiny fraction of the sound, very narrow band, very faint whistle sounds. And they use these vessels only when they come together and play. So it was really interesting to, to investigate that. So I, I did graduate from Hammock University. So at that time at my graduation, uh, graduating from university as a behavior ecologist on animals was basically a certificate for unemployment, right? I mean, you, you had basically no really chance of a job, especially when you were an expert on whale acoustics in Northern Germany, because there was no, no, uh, you know, requirement there, not yeah. no, no market or anybody doing it. So basically I, I, I think I got lucky in the, um, in 2000, I joined an environmental consultancy and ran their environmental programs on, on environmental impact assessment for offshore wind farms. Right. And I basically have been in offshore wind farm business since then. Um, I joined the Center for Environment, Fisheries, and Aquaculture Science in 2007 uh, in CFAS in, um, in Lowestoft, a, a very, very nice agency. And I got more involved in, on, uh, you know, impacts of underwater noise on, on marine life, uh, on aquatic life. I also represented the UK at the uh, OSPA Convention and London Convention, and that was quite a big honor. I mean, I was very proud of doing that. And uh, since 2011, I work at DHI, which is an international advisory uh, firm, private, but not for profit. So that's very nice. And we're international. So we are worldwide distributed and basically do the same stuff as ever. I mean, I'm, I'm, we are doing a lot of projects and modeling the behavior of whales in response to underwater sound. So, so this is basically the focus of my work nowadays is what are the effects of underwater sound, underwater noise on marine life fishes and marine mammals? And what can we do uh, do about that? Cool. Yeah, that, that leads really well into into the main topic. So, the big question is: uh, How loud are our oceans? Well, it's, that's that's a very difficult question to answer because loudness is some kind of subjective uh, yeah. criteria. You know, uh, what, what somebody uh, you know uh, uh, experiences as very noisy is for another person is not very loud because we have different sensitivities, also psychological, uh, you know, um, layouts. But basically, you can say that the, the oceans have are, are noisy. They have been always noisy because there's a lot of, you know, natural activity. Marine life produces underwater sound a lot. Whales call, um, you know, killer whales call, fishes sing choruses, there's snapping shrimp. So there's all kinds of biological sounds anyways. And then geothermal uh, activity, which adds to the, what we call the, the soundscape, what is there in sound. And since industrialization, humans have added to that sound source. Uh, you know, shipping, steamboats. Um, now it's a lot about, you know, offshore construction, for example, for offshore wind. And so there is a, you know, there are a variety of new sound sources out there that haven't been there before, and they are making the waters 
more noisier as they have been. Right. So, like the, the so in terms of, of, of that, are there, are there different areas of the ocean? I mean, obviously, depending on where, that, how sort of loud are like coasts yeah. and stuff compared to like deep yeah. ocean? Are we able to even yeah. measure that, measure the differences? Yeah, it's a good question. We basically look mainly at activities. I mean, if you look at the waters around the United Kingdom, for example, or Netherlands, or at the Southern North Sea, for example, yeah. that's a very busy area. There's a lot of shipping lanes. There's a lot of offshore construction. There's a lot of oil and gas platforms. So all kinds of sounds there, which lead to uh, quite a noisy area. Good example is also the Baltic seas with the shipping that's really going on and, and, and you know, and, and covering a lot of areas with underwater noise. Whereas looking at the high seas, we're more concerned with, you know, shipping because the, the only really thing that's going on there in terms of human generated sound is, is, is shipping. And that right. can have also impacts from, from the large shipping lanes internationally. So there are differences from where you look at, uh, whether you look at the deep seas, there's of course also now deep sea mining plant that can also have underwater noise, but basically most concern is around the areas where there is very high human activity and these are yeah. due to the coastal areas and many continents where there's a lot of human activity yeah and i suppose where there's more human activity is there less noise from marine life from from that different aspect or yeah you know, does, does the noise of the human yeah. part deter them you know i suppose um, it, it would deter marine yeah. animals or yeah. That's, that's a possibility. We don't, I mean, we, the, the, your, your example is good. I mean, if we, I give you one example, when, when I did record kilowatts in British Columbia, where they, they do, um, they do, um, they're actually not more quieter, they're actually noisier, louder, right. Right. the race of the, the background noise. It's called a cocktail party at the Lombard effect, actually, the Lombard effects where they, right. where animals get louder in response to underwater sound just to reach above the ambient right. noise level. And, and that, that we can see, but in general, um, yeah, where there's very high noise levels, I don't know if the animals are necessarily all loud or shutting up, but it certainly affects them. And the underwater noise can, or it can affect them. And it can affect them in many ways. Um, you know, there's physiological impacts, you know, hearing impacts yeah. can affect the, uh, the hearing of marine uh, life, of aquatic life. There can be behavioral impacts and and all the way to, you know, a serious injury or even death through, for example, stranding events. Yeah. So noise so can have a lot of impacts. And what you have to consider here, especially, is that underwater is just a perfect or very good uh, transducer for, 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 uh, for water. is a very good transducer for underwater sound. So it, it travels much faster than the air and there's much less attenuation. So consequently, the impact ranges can be quite large underwater. Right. How do we... How do we... In a measure underwater noise. So, how do we know how loud certain parts of the ocean are? Is there certain techniques that we use yeah. to, to, to measure that? Well, you put an underwater microphone, we call it a hydrophone, in the water. You have a standardized distance to the to the ship, for example, and you just record the sound and measure the right. sound pressure level, and then you try to perform a back calculation to get the sound at one meter distance uh, from from the ship. So, you basically record it. Right. And then can you determine what part, you know, what part of the noise is coming from what's in the sources or, or is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, you have basically at the end of the process, you should have an acoustic signature of, right. of the signal source, which is basically composed of the loudness, you know, that's the decibel level, the intensity. And then what is equally important, even more important, is the frequency range over which the sound is being active. Uh, for, for example, shipping sound is mainly... Um, mainly in the frequencies, what we call lower frequencies, below one kilohertz. Um, and, and, um, and whereas other sound, you know, um, is, is a little bit higher, so can reach well above one kilohertz. But right. most industrial sound we have learned over the past decades is actually in the range of what we call of low frequency sound. That's seismic air guns, that's uh, for geophysical exploration, that's shipping sound, that's offshore wind farm construction and operation. They all seem to be, although there's a higher frequency content, most of the energy, if not all of the energy, is below that one kilohertz margin and even much lower. Right. So when, say, you know, do, do these these sort of human man-made things, do they consider um, the noise they make underwater or is it just something that, you know, happens and, and it's a consequence of the work being done? Or is there any way that, that you know, these, these sort of things can reduce underwater noise or is it just something yeah. that, that happens? 
No, it's. Uh, I think there are a variety of uh, measures you can take to make uh, sounds uh, quieter, and there are uh, or, or sources quieter, and they are applied. I mean, there there has been since the beginning of the research in underwater noise. That's mainly very much in the last ten years, but you know, research has been going on for many decades. But you know, basically in academic circles now, it's really like more considered more of an issue. So right. what we what we always suggest is to apply a risk based framework for investigation noise impact. So you you investigate the impacts on the animals going through a stepwise procedure, and if you find an impact, you you try to what we call mitigate the noise. And there are different variety of measures you can take. You can try, for example, in, in uh, when it comes to pile driving, you can put something in between air. So you can put something in between the sound source, the pile driver, and the animal. And uh, for example, a bubble curtain just emanating bubbles, and the sound is right. reflected and, and much reduced. So this has been used in Europe um, on a very large scale in the North Sea right. with show wind farm construction. And we find that, you know, if the water depth is right, so and and if there are certain conditions met, the sound can be much reduced. So right. that, that are really uh, quite impressive, but it has to be uh, emphasized here that we also equally have to investigate if the frequency is something that the animals can hear. Right. So that's what, what I, what kind of my topic is, uh, together with a colleague, I, I published a paper about three years back about taking the animals' perspective on underwater sound. We think it's very important to ask the question: What can the animals hear? And you know, not only how loud is something. It, it, you know, we, 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 we don't really uh, record or, you know, uh, bad sounds in the air. And they, they are incredibly right. loud. Because we, we, we just don't have any sensitivity for that frequency-wise. We cannot hear that. So uh, there is also sounds that marine life probably is not so sensitive to because, you know, it can be very loud because they, they are sensitivity is not there. So, that's right. a so in this kind of assessments that we're doing, it's very important to look at both the loudness, the intensity of the sound, and the frequency of the sound. Right. Slightly off topic, but do you, do you know what like, the, la the, the loudest animal in the, in the ocean is? Or, or is no, that... That, <laughs> that depends on the sound, but I, I guess what has been one of the loudest animals is the sperm whale. The echolocation right. clicks uh, are quite intense, far above 200 uh, decibel. Now, underwater, that's difficult to compare on land, so yeah. that, you know, that's nothing to do with uh, yeah. in-air acoustics. But, you know, a colleague of mine, um, the late Battle Mull, made a very um, nice paper some years back. He said, uh, sperm whale sonar rivals human maze sonar. Right. And he could show that actually the sperm whale sounds are incredibly loud, incredibly loud. And, and there's one theory actually called the Big Bang Theory, actually, that the whales deter squid with the sound. It's so loud that it can actually make a squid non-moving. And then the animals just, you know... Uh, actually shock them with the, the sound it has never been proven but the this uh, but the uh, that the sounds are very loud has been documented yeah anyway. wow that's amazing yeah, <laughs> so but so as you know i think it's safe to say you know human activity in the ocean with things like you know wind, wind farms and things like that yeah. has increased quite a bit in the last sort of yeah. you know 10 to 15 years yeah. Are we starting to see more and more negative impacts as a result of that? Or is it a, t a case of, you know, we've seen more activities and so more research is taking place and are we starting to see negative impacts? Obviously you talked about some of the mitigation techniques we've got, like the, the bubble curtains and things yeah. like that. But yeah. Are we starting yeah. to see more negative you know, impacts on, on the ocean? It's, or It's so difficult to, ask, to make a research on that because yeah. you know, if you look at... Um, what is really important is that, that underwater noise is one of the pressures out there. It's, you know, if you look in, in the harbor bubbles, for example, swimming in the sea, it's affected by many things, bycatch and fishing gear, there's pollution, you know, there's underwater sound. And so there are all kinds of impacts on the animals. So there's multiple pressures acting on the ecosystem. And yes, um, we have indications that some of the populations are affected by what we right. call this yeah. cocktail when it's like for a long period of time. But in many cases, you know, when our risk assessment tells us, uh, you know, that the frequencies are frequencies that the animals can hear and the loudness is, is such as, you know, the, it's above certain thresholds, then we can take some precautionary action without right. actual proof uh, because it's very difficult. Um, but only when the risk assessment says so. Sometimes the risk assessment says us that, they, or tells us that the animals cannot, it's probably not a problem. 
But in some cases, there might be a problem. Then you have to monitor very, very closely the okay. population, of course, but also the underwater sound. And, and uh, that's what we can do. So it's very difficult to say that we see certain impacts on population. You also have to consider in order to, to see an impact, you have to have, to have the tools to measure that. Right. So we, when we go out and count whales, we use airplanes and ships and we use them maybe once a month or, you know, right. well, that's the best measure that we can have. So the, the statistics of these investigations are so variable that in order to show an impact or a change, we have to do many, 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 many surveys or the impact has to be very, very large. Yeah. So it's almost like very difficult to, to, to do that. So we do apply the precautionary principle in many cases where we, when our risk assessment tells us that this is an impact, then we try to take measures. And there have been quite a number of measures now taken, actually, and especially in Europe. Great. So that leads, leads on nicely to, to a bit about policy. So I understand you're the chair of the European Marine Board's mm -hmm. Underwater Noise Committee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about, you know, in terms of policy, what, you know, what, what, what has the Euro European Marine Board been doing to sort of try and mitigate the effects and sort of cover yeah. what, what we've been talking about in terms of the impacts yeah. of, of underwater noise? The European Marine Board is, you can say it's a huge think tank, actually. It represents right. 10,000 scientists in Europe from universities and research organizations. So it's quite a big, uh, you know, powerful organization. And uh, what, what, what the EMB, the European Marine Board, does is it works at the, what they call the interface of, you know, science and policy. So the, the report that came out under my chairmanship is actually, it's called a scientific a future science brief. It's not a right. lengthy report, not a very big document. It's just synthesizing on a, you know, for in, in a very easy to understand way for the decision makers and for everyone who's interested, what are the impacts of underwater sound? What can we do about that and so forth? And then it makes actually practical recommendations for future research. And this is really the remit of that report is making some kind of synthesis and based on the synthesis making some kind of suggestions you know for future research priorities and we came up with 13 of these priorities right. um, that that should be applied and then this is really important work because in many of the um, you know many of the regulators say they don't of course they, they're not expert in that particular issue so they they don't understand they cannot decide what to focus on so we have to help them a little bit and get yeah. into a constructive dialogue and this is why this work was Pretty good from from that group, I think. Very um, very rewarding, actually. Great. So in terms of that, are we, are we starting to see those recommend recommendations, you know, come into force or, or, or sort yeah. of starting to have an effect? Yeah, there's a lot of we do a lot of recommendations on research priorities, of course, because right. we still lack a lot of knowledge. So one example is, of course, what what is you know, when you look at fishes, for example, they're quite sensitive to underwater sound from yeah. From, from impulsive uh, sources, and they can be affected on a, at least theoretically, affected quite on a large distance from a pile driver, for example. Pile driving is quite intense. So, right. you know, but there, there are very, very little studies, um, you know, in this, uh, this displacement because it's very difficult to do so. So you have to have a big ship you, uh, to monitor the, the fish probably. You have to have some good equipment, cameras or tags or whatever you put on the fishes. And you have to have a lot of time and resources to do that. So these research um, projects take millions of euro, of course. And, and you know, fishes are a low priority. And even for, for marine mammals, this research has been done only in the last, you know, 10 years or so, maybe a little bit longer. Right. But, you know, it's this is why these research priorities are important because, you know, it has then, you know, a really foundation for the decision, decision makers to say, okay, we take that study. I was involved 10 years ago um, in uh, at my role at CFAS in a really cool study where we put fish in very, very large underwater net pans and played right. back sounds to them, pie driving sounds, and, and looked at their reactions. So we simulated nature a little bit. And even that investigation, I mean, you can say it was controlled. It, it costs quite a bit, quite a bit of money. And, yeah. Uh, you know, these investigations are expensive. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. It's, it's a really interest, interesting subject. And I think it's one that, in my opinion, doesn't really get talked about that much. I think in terms of like people, you know, I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, the, the impact that, that yeah. sort of human activity yeah. has on yeah. marine yeah. life, not only like physically, but mm -hmm. in terms it's of... It's just a recent topic. It, you know, 20 years ago, it was a nerd thing, right? You, right. People were studying at universities and whatever, and that that's fine. Um, but, you know, um, 
was more like a theoretical uh, concept, but yeah. that has changed and, and that yeah. has changed vastly now. Now it's actually discussed on you know, also on UN level. You know, there was yeah. meetings at UN level on underwater sound, and and so that's that's really good. I think that's really yeah, important. no, it's it's great. It's getting the limelight. I think it, it needs and, and and deserves. So exactly. yeah, no, thank thank you so much for talking to me, Frank. I think it's a really interesting subject. We'll have some links to um, the European Marine Board and, yeah. and and the place you work for as well. So um, just so if anyone wants to find out more, um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me today, Frank. What's my pleasure, Will. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.